be seated at this time. Open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. We'll be finishing up 1 Peter today. Have a couple of announcements real quick. Um, last week I announced that we had a constitution that we're trying to get accomplished. So if um, you've had a chance to take that constitution and look it over, we're looking for feedback. There's also some more copies at the back there. My dad's holding them up. They're on the table back by the... Um, nursery window. Um, if you don't want a hard copy, you can look on the website and just click on our constitution. And we're looking in for input there because there may be things that we uh, neglected to put in the constitution or should be taken out. Um, our, our goal is to streamline it. The Bible itself doesn't have, um, here's the constitution for the church. This is something that we do for the state because we're an organization, a 501c3. Uh, so you're going to find our Constitution to be pretty generic, as in what the Bible says, that's in our Constitution. What the Bible doesn't say, we leave out of the Constitution. So um, we do spell out how we operate here, what we do here. So something I want you to look at, because it's not, because this is your church, and we're looking for your wisdom and your input on that. Also, on Saturday, there's going to be a baptism. I want to be clear about baptism in that it has nothing to do with salvation, in that it doesn't make you any more or any less saved. It makes you more or less wet. Um, <laughs> but we do believe in, in, in baptism by immersion for new believers. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, then what you're doing is you're giving a testimony to the world that I've decided to follow Jesus. You're identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's a symbol, a ceremony, of something that's gone on personally between you and God. You're making public to other people. So if there's any questions on that or anything, just talk to me. It's, um, it can be a little scary because it's a ritual or something you haven't done before, but it's really not. It's, it's pretty informal in that it's just me and you in the Hay River and 20 people looking at you or 30 or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but they're going to be up on a bank and we're going to be down here so they won't hear if I mess up my lines or you mess up yours. No, but it's, it's really just a way to, um, for us to celebrate your walk with Jesus, with the family of God. Also, I wanted to announce there's going to be a men's Bible study starting. Um, this is something that's near and dear to my heart because if you ask, um, if I took a survey of you all and said, what makes a man a man? When does a boy become a man? What, what's the ceremony or what's the event? How many answers do you think I would get in this crowd? Because we don't have a ceremony where you go from, I knight you from boyhood to manhood. So for some people, that's when they join the army or when they have their own house or the first time that they're with a woman or the first time they get married or the first time. I mean, there is just a, we don't know. We, we don't know as a society. But the Bible has very uh, direct terms about what a man is. And the, the book that we're going to be going through is The Measure of a Man. And um, because it's assumed that if you grow up, like wisdom come with, comes with age, or when you grow up, you'll be a man. But sometimes um, age arrives all by itself. <laughs> so you have sometimes men, like they're, they're what you call boys that shave. They're guys who've grown up, but they've never assumed that role of manhood. And um, when it talks about... I. I was under a false impression at one time I was going to be an elder at Calvary Baptist Church in Eau Claire, and they took me through this book, and I thought it was the qualifications for an elder or deacon, because it is, um, but these are the qualif qualifications for manhood, and so that I would be able to reach out and tap basically anybody, any man in the congregation, and say, this is what mature manhood looks like, this is what character looks like in a man, and so... Um, we obviously all, all men, uh, fall short of that standard. But I think that it's important to know what that standard is. 
what is expected of you as a man. So um, I would like as many people to be able to participate in it that want to. So just let me know um, if you're interested and what days work for you because I'll make it work for my schedule. But obviously we can't accommodate everybody. I mean, we all have a lot of different schedules. But I'd love for you to be a part of it. Um, where we're going to hold it, whether it be at the church or somewhere else, that's to be determined also. So just let me know on that, on what time would work for you. So let's dive into Scripture now. Uh, we're in the last part of First Peter, and First Peter is written to a church that's coming under fire, uh, a church that is beginning to experience persecution. Um, I'm glad we're never going to have to experience anything like that. Um, <laughs> I can't even imagine a time in our country where we might actually be persecuted because we're Christians. Um, and that's kind of where they were at. It wasn't there yet, but it was coming, and it was coming pretty strong. And what he's trying to do is say, be steady. Because when bad things happen, you know what you want to do? What happened? What do we do wrong? If something bad happens to me, I'm like, what did I do wrong? Or what did you do wrong? Like, I could trip over something, and before I'm even, the pain is even reaching my brain, I'm going, who left this here? You know, I'm looking for an excuse for why something happened. So it's easy, as we look through First Peter, it talks about getting along with government, getting along at your job, getting along in your relationships, getting along at church. Because it's easy when hard times come to point the finger and say, you know what the problem is? The government. Oh, the problem is my wife. Oh, the problem is society. You know what the problem is? And so leading, ramping up to this point where we're at in our society, I've heard a lot of speeches about, you know what's wrong with our country? You know what's wrong with society? You know what's wrong with the church? And I'm, I've been very adamant about this. Don't get ramped up into that. What's wrong with you? What about you and your little red wagon? How are you doing? Are you operating the way you're supposed to be doing? Because that's what Peter tells us to is don't in get encumbered with that other stuff. You get busy about what God tells you to do and realize if you're following God absolutely perfect, bad things are still going to happen to you. Um, I had a, recently had someone ask me, terrible things are happening to me. What do you think's wrong? <laughs> uh, could be a number of things. Um, but having had the same uh, questions myself at times, I kind of researched it at one point and I looked at Second Corinthians chapter Chapter 1 says that God is the God of all comfort, and that he comforts us in our affliction so that we can comfort other people. Sometimes things happen to you just so you can relate to other people. Do you believe that? Sometimes you just go through stuff, seems random, but like a month later you're talking to four people about it, and they're like, because if you're ever talking to somebody and they're going through a problem, you say, yeah, I can relate to you, and you really can't, it makes them really mad. You know, they're like, you can't relate to me. What are you talking about? So God will actually let those things happen to us. That's Second Corinthians chapter 1. It's a very encouraging passage because it says, Our Father is the Father of all comfort. The Holy Spirit is called the Comforter. Jesus Christ is the Comforter also. So all three parts of the Godhead are about comforting us here in our misery here on earth in times of trouble. God cares about your pain. So he doesn't allow it randomly. We're not just, ah, this just happens. But the other thing that it talks about is in Hebrews chapter 12, it says that God disciplines those who he loves, who are his children. So sometimes when you experience pain, it's kind of like behind the woodshed, take you out back and, hey, buddy, I've tried to get your attention through the still, small voice, but here we are. The pain opens my ears. You know, each one of us get hit a different way. Some people, if you hit them in the wallet, they go like, what, I'm listening. Some people, you know, it's their physical pain. Sometimes it's, it's um, relational things. So different ones of us have different receptors that God goes, okay, I'm sorry, but you're not listening. And that's Hebrews chapter 12. And then James chapter 1 says, count it pure joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the trying of your faith working, worketh patience so that the people of God will be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So that's kind of like the army thing, good training, good training. Kind of pure joy. Whenever bad things happen, you're like, this is good training. It's, a, it's equipping me to do what God wants me to do. Now the question is, which one of those three is it when you're experiencing pain? And don't ask me, because I don't know what you're going through. 
but God's not tricky. If you daily walk with him and give your life to him saying, you can have my day and just take care of my life, Lord. I'll just give you today. He'll reveal to you what, it's, what it is. He'll reveal to you what you're going through. He's not really like, I'm punishing you, but, or I'm disciplining you, but I'm not going to let you know why. He's not a tricky dad. He's a straightforward father. So that's why the church, when it's going through pain, you have a tendency to get distracted. And what Peter's trying to tell these people here is, don't think it's some strange thing when these things happen to you. You know, this is what happened to our Lord. And if we bear his name as Christian, then these things are going to happen to us. Um, So let's just wade into Scripture here. If we look at the last verse from last week, it was, So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right. Keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to God. I mean, that is a great placard. Keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to God. Because he's the one who's going to take care of you. It says, to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. He'll never fail you. And now a word to you who are elders in the church. I, too, am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. I, too, will share in his glory when he is revealed to the whole world. As a fellow elder, I appeal to you, care for the flock that God has entrusted you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. And when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. So he addresses the elders here first. I want you to notice that the apostle Peter, some people believe that he was the first pope of the church. He doesn't say, I'm the apostle, first pope of the church. I'm going to tell you guys, he goes, I'm a fellow elder. That's the perfect picture of an elder's attitude of what it should be. I'm just one of the guys. I'm not something special. This is something that God's put on me to do. An elder is... And, and this word, elder, is the word presbytos. And presbytos is, can be translated pastor, elder, um, bishop, um, different, different things like that, overseer. Now, elder is a, is a description of the character of the person, that they're not a new Christian, that they're a mature man in the faith. Um, what they do is they oversee, that is a, or they, uh, they shepherd. And then like bishop or whatever would be a title. So there's different titles. And like people call me Pastor Rich. It's like, well, I guess if there was other riches around, I'd be like, okay, well, that distinguishes me. But I'm just the teaching elder. And you can call me Rich. That's fine. Um, I'm not really in the titles. I don't deserve any titles. I'm just one of the elders. And that's kind of our constitution lays that out. We took out, kind of stripped out the thing of pastor and went the teaching elder. You know, because I have no bigger vote than Chuck or Jeff or whoever. You know, it's, um, I, I don't believe in that system where you have a figurehead. You know, when I, um, somebody took me on a little bit about something I'd said, and I, I encouraged that. No, no problem. Uh, I don't mind being challenged. It either strengthens my views or modifies them. And I think we should all have that attitude. You know, that we should be able to, listen to someone else and go, hmm, didn't think of it that way. And if I can't articulate my point of view, then maybe I need to change my point of view. So, and they're like, well, I know you're the pastor. I'm like, <laughs> no. I'm, I teach when I'm up here, and I teach with authority because I teach from the Word of God. When I step down off of here, you can talk to me like anybody else. If you disagree with what I say, perfect. Let's, let's go to the Bible with it. So this idea of elder, this is something that um, Peter talks to them about, he says, I want you to do this, you know, willingly. I want you to do it eagerly. And I want you to do it exemplary. So not because, oh, well, it's my obligation. Got to do what I got to do. That's no attitude for an elder. And not for um, the King James, I like it says, filthy lucre. <laughs> do you guys know what lucre is? It's money. You don't do it for dirty money. Don't be, don't be, you know, leading the church for the money. 
you know, which uh, thank God I can say <laughs> I have a great record in that. You know, whatever, if, if, it, um, if it pays, it pays. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You do what God tells you to, and you let him sort out your finances for you. You know, um, but there, he's warning against professionalism in leadership. And there's a real danger in that. Because guys who get in it for the profession reasons, they do it grudgingly. I'm the leader. I guess I got to do it. You've seen this in leadership. Or they do it, you know, like it's all about the money. And you can see their emphasis on money. Or the next thing, it says don't lord it over them. Um, not that a pastor would ever act like that. <laughs> do not lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. It's hard when you're in a position of authority and you see people mess up. And I'm going to tell you what, as things get worse in the church, and as things get more controversial, it'll be a temptation to go, oh, 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 that's not my job. My job is to tell you the truth, lead you in the truth, show you what it looks like, make it look attractive, then you come along for the ride or not. I'm not putting up fences. Someone goes over that cliff, I'm going to be like, don't do that anymore. But I'm not going to go over there and put up a rule. I can't stand this idea of rules because one person messes up, we're going to make a rule for everybody. So, well, if we let you do that, we'd have to let everybody. No, you don't. You can use your common sense and be arbitrary and go, I mean, every one of my children, I treated them fairly, but I did not treat them all alike. Some of my children could handle certain things. Other children could not. We're like, he can do that. You can't. You know, that w I knew that was the way with my brother, and I, there's some things I could handle he couldn't, some things he could handle I couldn't. You know, my sister the same way. We did not get treated alike. We got treated fairly according to the good judgment of my parents. And even so much more so, I'm not your parent. So just as being a leader, I'm going to show you the right way to go. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. But God forbid I lord it over you, exercising some sort of unbiblical authority. Because what happens is, is pastors or elders turn into thugs. And then what kind of example is that? You know, if you're, if you're a, a church leader and you're kind of a, a bully or a thug, what do you teach your people? Well, if you serve enough time and you get up where I'm at, then you can be a thug and a bully. <laughs> and then everybody wants to join the church like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So I'll, I'll just give you a hint into that is um, in our Constitution, there was like three pages about how to remove me. Like the pastor's here, and like it takes like special counsels and three outside guys. And duh, duh, duh. I was like, nope. Same way you remove Chuck's, the same way you remove me. The same way you remove Jeff, the same way you remove me. A, majority, uh, a unanimous vote from the elder board. So if I get a lot of line, yeah, I'm not going to run this place with iron fists. I'll be like, you're out of here, Rich. No, thank you. None of that here. And I thank God for it. Because that breeds servant leadership, which is what Peter's talking about here. So it says, um, but lead them with your own good example in verse 3. And when the great shepherd appears, he will you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. That's where you get your reward. Because this idea of thuggish behavior, manipulative behavior, what that is, is that's me counting on you to satisfy me. And if you've ever noticed this, sometimes people go into lines of work because they have their own problems to fix. Sometimes people will counsel other people because they have a problem with that. Like um, when I came out of uh, drugs and drug addiction, you know what I wanted to be? A drug counselor. You know, is that a good idea? Mm, maybe way down the line, but no, not really so much. I'd have been working on myself. You know, so be careful about trying to work on yourself through working on other people. But it says, in the same way, you younger men must accept the authority of the elders, and all of you serve each other in humility. So the earmark of a Christian through this whole book has been humility, submission, meekness, not to be misunderstood with weakness or lack of character. Because it takes a lot of character and it takes a lot of strength to be under control, to not to not say the thing that comes to your mind. And I, I know a lot of the things that are going on in our society, they insult our intelligence. 
you're like, that doesn't make any sense. I'm going to start screaming. You know, it's like, um, remember, and don't mix up what's going on in our society with Christianity. Christianity is the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus Christ and him crucified. And as long as I get to preach the gospel, as long as I get to meet like the Bible says, then that's what we're going to do. And I'm not backing down on those things. But it's easy to get caught up in the weeds and other things. I can't even spell hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> I can barely pronounce it just now. But it's easy to get in the weeds on that. And maybe it's false, maybe it's true, but you can get in this reality and lose track of the truth. What's the truth? I'm here to put Jesus high and exalted. And I can't get in the way of that for other people. I can't, get it, I can't let my personality and political stance get in the way of that. So don't ever, it's easy when you think about Jesus being meek. He was not weak. It said Moses was the meekest man ever. Not weak. Meek. That means power under control. I think of one of these Roman horses, war horses. You know, they had the bit and the bridle in their mouth, and they would just stand there and wouldn't, wouldn't bolt during the, during the fight. Under control. And if you've ever seen a horse in battle, that kind of thing, it's like, oh my word, what a fierce creature. But under control, it's amazing. A horse out of control, very dangerous. So same way with a Christian. Under control, very dangerous to the enemy. Out of control, dangerous to everyone around them. So be humble towards each other. This is all it says, and all of you serve each other in humility, for God opposes the proud but favors the humble. So pride deserves or demands recognition, whereas humility only needs recognition from God. So this humility is like, I'll answer to God, I'll answer to God. Whereas if you're prideful, you're like, you'll answer to me. How dare you treat me that way? How dare you talk to me that way? Remember, God resists that. Think about God and how powerful he is. Do you want resistance from God? <laughs> I mean, just the resistance of life is bad enough. I don't want God opposing me, causing me in my life friction or drag. You know, it says God opposes, resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I say grace for me, so that means humility for me. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Humble yourself to God. He'll, he's the one that will give you the honor. It says, give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. So humbling yourself before God and his mighty power and, him, and waiting for him to lift you up, that's looking for affirmation from God. And then when it says, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you, that's letting your security be from God. And I'll be sexist here for a minute. I think guys like a pat on the back. Guys want to be approved of. You know, they, they like when people go, yeah, you're right. You know, men like to be right. Here it says God will, God will basically honor you at the right time if you're a man. I think women basically like security. So when you have worries... It says, cast your worries on God. When you have this need for affirmation, realize God's the one who will honor you and pat you on the back. So God's got both things covered here. You know, I love, the, I love those two verses together, verse 6 and 7. Now, verse 8 is very important. I want you to pay particular attention to this. It says, stay alert. Wake up. On guard. Get ready. Why? Watch out for the great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking to devour. Now, if that doesn't scare you a little bit, it should. And a lot of times, Christians, I've even been guilty of this, saying, I'm sure the devil doesn't worry about little old me. You know, there's only one devil in all of us. Who cares? You know, he's probably not coming after me. You know what that is? That's my logic getting in the way of the Word of God. Because what does the Word of God say? Watch out. The devil wants a piece of you. He's walking around looking. He's surveilling. In the book of Job, it says, 
um, God says, have you considered my servant Job? You know what that word considered means? To do a full surveillance, like, have you looked at him to take him apart, to take him down? Have you done advanced surveillance on my boy Job? And um, the devil went, I sure have. But you got walls around that guy. If you drop the walls and you let me at him, he curse you to your face. And God said, not so. I want you to know the devil's doing the same thing with you. He's walking around like a roaring lion, looking who he can take down. Now, I want you to know some, there are some things that give the devil a foothold. You sin willfully, think, I know this is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm sure I can get by with it. The devil goes, oh my, what a nice opening. Anger opens the, de- the doorway for the devil. There's a lot of things that open the doorway where you're saying, come on in. I'm not really obedient to God right now. Have a seat at my table. And I want to tell you something. The devil has a plan for everyone. Every single person. You know how God has a plan for your life? The devil has a plan for your life. He wants to mar you and destroy you. He, he has a, the devil can't beat God. Do you know that? And he knows he can't. So if I can't beat somebody, this is, I learned this from a guy who was into ninjutsu. He's a, into a Brazilian fighter. And he said, oh yeah, we, we're basically learn it, win at any cost. Win the way you have to win. It's like, well, what if you can't beat somebody? He says, you go get their children. It's like, whoa. Well, that's the philosophy and the strategy of our enemy, the devil. He cannot beat God head on. What does God love? What does God put a value on? You and me, human beings. And what You can look at the world and go, what in the world is going on here? The world is doing everything it can to debase and degrade and mar human beings. The devil would like to see you dead. If you're unsaved, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, the devil wants you dead before you do. If you have accepted Christ as your Savior, you know what he'd like to see you do? Commit suicide. So that the world could say, doesn't make a difference. He'd like to see you degraded so the world could say, Christianity doesn't make a difference. Don't be lax when it comes to the devil. That's something I want you to know. On the other hand, I want you to know this. The devil has no power over you that you don't give him. The devil has no power over that you don't give him. He can never take away the calling of God in your life. Did you know that? But he can convince you to walk away from it. There have been countless times that I've been tempted to go, I'm walking away from this. God has not changed his mind about my life. God hasn't changed his mind about me or you. He has plans for you to prosper you. He has plans for you that will never end. But the devil can convince you, you blew it. It's too late. Can't do that. You know what screams against that? The blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ removes every spot and stain. We are perfectly seated in the heavenlies, perfect in God's eyes. You need to claim that. Go, absolutely true. The devil has no, no power over me. So be aware of him. Realize he has a purpose and a plan for your life. But in the same sense, you need to know he has no power over you that you don't give him. So you can say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I resist you. I will not cave into this. It says in the Bible, resist the devil and he will flee from you. What does resist mean? Resist means what it means. Nope, 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 not doing that. You said something comes out of your mouth that's wrong. You go, nope, that was wrong. That was evil. That was, you know, the blood of Jesus has covered that. I'm still right in God's eyes. I'm going to keep serving him. You would not believe the amount of time. The difference between maturity and immaturity of the faith is this. When you sin, if you see the blood of Jesus Christ is instantly restoring you with God, that's maturity. If you mess up and sin, and you think it's going to take a week for you to get back on your feet, you don't fully understand where you are at with Jesus Christ. You need to believe what he says about the restorative process of the blood of Jesus Christ. 
You are perfect and spotless in his eyes. Every sin that you have ever committed is absolutely paid for. You need to acknowledge that to God. And you need to get back up and do what you're supposed to do, irregardless of how you feel. I don't care if you feel guilty. I'm I'm getting ready to go off. I am so I am so sick and tired of the phrase, I can't forgive myself. I don't care if you forgive yourself. Where did that phrase come from? That phrase is erroneous. It doesn't make any sense. Let's say you forgive yourself. I killed 100 people. I forgave myself. Well, good for you. Who cares if you forgive yourself or not? It matters if you're innocent in God's eyes. He's the one who, who judges the eternal soul. You're like, I've asked God for forgiveness, but I just don't forgive myself. I don't care. Trust what he says. You are innocent in his eyes. You don't care how you feel about it. Let's say, well, I, I still feel awful bad about it. Well, maybe God's leaving that there. So you don't do it again. Maybe you're supposed to feel bad for a couple of years about things you've done. The Apostle Paul said that. He said, I feel terrible about what I did in the past. Why, you don't forgive yourself, Paul? You know, who cares? I mean, I'll get back on Scripture here, but that's just a little, <laughs> little pet peeve of mine is you are totally, completely forgiven in God's eyes. Believe what he says. Don't believe what you feel about it. Don't believe what psychiatrists say about it. Don't believe in this process. God says it's true. Put your faith on it. Stand on it. Say, that's truth. If I feel bad about it and I feel guilty about it, maybe that'll be something that helps me from doing it again. Praise God for the restorative process that I know I'm right with him, but maybe I feel bad, but that's okay because that'll help me as I'm going forward. That, that memory of in the back of my mind, I see the hurt I caused and I feel the hurt I caused and it keeps me on the straight and narrow. Maybe that's his bumper guards helping me through but i can always say but i'm right with you god right yeah i know you feel bad son that's okay but you're right with me i paid for that you're perfect in my eyes keep walking keep walking but so back to the scripture okay <laughs> but the devil wants to get us in those traps that's the devil's devices did you know that the devil plays tricks on us. It says, the Bible says, don't be ignorant about the devil's devices. Don't be ignorant about the devil's tricks. Because one of the tricks he always says to us is, oh, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. Go ahead, do it. It's no big deal. It's no big deal. And as soon as you do it, he goes, oh, man, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> That's the worst thing ever. You're probably not a Christian. I mean, I just don't know how you'll ever solve that. That's all oh, Jesus probably doesn't want to see you. And no, don't go to church to get that straightened out. That's the devil's trick. It's no big deal. Oh, it's the worst thing in the world. He'll tempt you into doing it and then beat you up for doing it. It's a, it's a simple devil trick. We don't want to get in that spot. People go, I don't want to go to church because I don't have anything to give. Like, that's what you're supposed to go to church for. Yeah, come here because we need you to give us something. No, you come in here because this is a sanctuary. Away from the world. It's a place to recharge our batteries. It's a place to worship the Lord. Open his word and say, here's truth. Because you know what? There's a lot of untruth going on out there. A lot of misinformation. There's so much misinformation, I can't tell you what's the misinformation and what's not. I don't know. I don't know who to believe, what to believe, how to believe. My, my brother's son, when he was little, his name was you know, Zach. He's up here sometimes and he comes around. Um, he's about maybe eight years old. He's being a little bit of a smart aleck, and I said something about truth. Yeah, I know. It's hard to believe with Zach. Um, but he said something about truth. He says, well, what's truth? And I went, I like to have an answer because I'm kind of a smart guy too. Um, <laughs> I said, you know the only thing that's true is what the Bible says. I said, everything else is debatable. He went, Okay, Uncle Rich. And I went, cool. And I found that to be absolutely true. It's what's in this word. That's truth. Everything else, discuss it amongst yourselves. Coffee talk. Put your pinky out and drink your coffee. Talk about it till the wee hours of the morning. If it's clear in here, it's clear and it's truth. If it's not clear in here, 
It's not in here. Make up your own mind. In his kindness, in verse 10, no, wait a second, it says, uh, stand firm, in verse 9, against him, and be strong in your faith. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are. It, misery loves company. That's why you need to go to church when you're hurting. Because when you're hurting and you walk in here, you go, I had it. If you're honest, because we all come in here and go, oh, I'm doing great. <laughs> Super, how are you doing? Outstanding. Everything's great. If you say, I've been hurting, man. I've been getting beat up this week. This has been tough. That's been tough. The other's been tough. You'll find out that other people say, me too. Or let me pray for you. You know, if you find someone else who's went through similar things to you, it takes that edge off like you don't feel like you're the only one. A device of Satan is to say, no one's ever been through this before. You're the only one suffering like this. It's so untrue. It says, brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are. The devil might, likes us to think that our suffering is unique when really everybody suffers. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever. So that's kind of the nut of what we're talking about in First Peter as a whole. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, strengthen you, and will place you on a firm foundation. We are here on this earth because God has a purpose for us, and it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. He didn't design it that way. So what do you need? I need a daily walk with God. I need Christian brothers and sisters next to me to help me up, for me to help, to keep me on the straight and narrow, you know, straighten me out when I'm walking crooked or whatever. Um, and God restores us. God supports us. God strengthens us on this walk. He says, I've written and sent this short letter to you with the help of Silas, whom I commend to you as a faithful brother. My purpose in writing is to encourage and assure that what you're experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you. I want to encourage and, in, and assure you this morning that the pain that you're going through is God's grace for you. God has a purpose and a plan, and if it's uncomfortable, it's okay. The grace of God is still with you. Because the, the phrase after that says, stand firm in God's grace. Stand firm in God's grace. That's what this church is founded on. That's what this church will live and die on. The grace of God. Not our merit. I'm not um, a good little boy, so God loves me. I'm a bad boy that God forgave. I trust in Christ. Period. Not by works of righteousness, which I've done, but according to his mercy, he saved me. It says, Your sister's your sister church in Babylon sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet each other in a, so King James says, with a holy kiss. That's a commandment, so I want to see you kissing each other afterwards. Um, the New Living says, greet each other with Christian love. What does that mean? It means uh, be affectionate with each other. Can you be affectionate? Well, never mind. I'll just say this. I'll say, the church of God should be close. The church of God should be affectionate towards each other. The church of God should be tight. You know, whatever it is, that expression in our culture, do that. Shake hands. Give each other a hug. Do whatever the Lord tells you to do. Put it on your heart there. It's actually commanded in Scripture. Peace be with all of you who are in Christ. Last thing he says is peace. Peace. Because that's what will earmark you to the world are you full of trouble and restlessness and fear and anger is that who people think of when they think of you do they think of an angry guy worried girl or do they think of this person has peace they're very peaceful may the peace of god be with you i want you to know that that's supernatural but that's what attracts the world to the gospel of jesus christ that we have peace, that we have joy, that we have boldness, that we have love. Those are the attributes of the Lord. 
So let's seek to um, push into that. As we next week we'll be in Second Peter because it's right on the next page here. <laughs> so you can read ahead. Um, I'll just give you a preview that um, next week in Second Peter, um, it's six years down the line. Six years of suffering. So let's see what six years of suffering brings to the church as um, Peter addresses them. Let's pray. Lord, you're so good to meet us here, to meet us where we are, but to want us to grow up into what you want us to be. We're supposed to be your servants, and we're supposed to bring light to the world. We're supposed to um, represent you. We are your body here on earth. So I pray, Lord, that you are supernaturally indwell us with your Holy Spirit, knowing that without your Holy Spirit, none of this is possible. Um, we don't have the power to do it. We're not good enough. We're not going to get good enough. So we do claim your grace. We do resist the devil, Lord. And we do ask for your Holy Spirit's power to continue to shine a light in our own little communities and the larger community. Uh, thanks for letting us be a part of it. We know that you could do this much more efficiently without us. But you want to have communion with us. So we give our lives to you once again. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't want to spend too much time, and I don't want to interrupt the flow of, of, of worship here. But uh, in keeping with what he was talking about, um, the battles that go on in our minds and even the stuff that we see on social media. Uh, if you're on Facebook... We have a uh, an Otter Creek Christian Fellowship Facebook page, and we, if you're kind of overwhelmed with some of the new songs that we're throwing out there, a lot of new songs as we as we go on. We we like the old songs, like the old hymns. We like new songs as well. But usually we share on there by Monday, Tuesday night. Our songs are up there for you guys to listen to throughout the week. Um, um, the way that we heard them the first time through somebody else singing those songs. But on that note, there's also announcements. There's also prayer requests. Post a prayer request on there. Post what's going on. Lift one another up. Um, we can use social media to tear each other down or tear into the world's ideas and point out what's wrong about things, but we can also build one another up. And... Uh, so check it out. You'll see some new songs on there. You'll also see an announcement. On September 27th, we're going to be having a worship night at Vino Cappuccino. It's a Sunday night. Um, we're looking forward to it. It'll be mostly an outdoor event. And hopefully we'll have other uh, worship leaders from other fellowships. We'll see other fellowships there. And uh, we're just going to have a night of worship in the community. So. There's only one authority that we have to do those things, and that's under the name of Jesus.
Father, I just pray that you would make that true of our lives. You already have in the sense that you see us as finished products, as finished works. Lord, yet we struggle. I just pray that we would just uh, surrender ourselves to you. We would keep you, the king, on the throne of our lives, regardless of the politics, and the perils of this world. You are the king. I just pray that you would fill us with your spirit, Lord. You just shine your light through us and in us. We just want to thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 